Good day, my name is H.B. Charles, Jr. I'm the senior pastor of the Shiloh Metropolitan Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Florida. And I write a blog that can be found at hbcharlesjr.com. I am privileged to have with me today a legend in the Jacksonville Church community, Dr. Rudolph McKissick, Sr. He is the senior pastor of the Bethel Baptist Institutional Church, which is about six or seven blocks away from where we are right now at the Shiloh campus. And he has served there for more than 46 years now. He is a legend in Christian ministry, and I'm honored to have him here today to Thank talk you. to us. Thank you. Dr. Kizik, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I don't know where to start. I don't know where to start 85 years ago. Uh, Are you a native Jackson? Native of Jacksonville, born, bred here. Mm -hmm. um, only left uh, to go to military and you know, in school mm -hmm. and uh, back in Jacksonville. What was your upbringing like? My upbringing, I uh, was brought up on the very street that this church is on, mm. Beaver Street, mm -hmm. uh, just uh, closer than the church is, 600 block. Mm. Um, it was, at that time, uh, uh, the downtown area and the La Villa area. Mm -hmm. I went to school over here. Uh, that's the annex, well, it's the, the uh, minister's conference building. That's where I went to elementary school. Yes. So I'm between elementary school where I went and then there's the Stanton High School. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it was in the next block from me. Mm -hmm. So I was brought up from the educational aspect from that elementary to the high school and I almost pass it every day and that's <laughs> been, I finished high school I guess about 60 some odds, almost 70 years ago. Wow. But I uh, brought up in a section that was a very mixed section of uh, uh, I call um, an integrated area of professions, professionals, and uh, just regular people. Mm -hmm. And but it was the best thing in the world for me because I got a taste of both sides. Sure, we were not uh, affluent in, by any means. Uh, just uh, my father lost his business. He was a tailor. He lost his business during the depression. Mm -hmm never regained uh, any uh, sense of uh, economic uh, strength, uh, but we never knew it wow. because he was able to always provide for us and just basic things, nothing mm -hmm. extraordinary. Mm -hmm. But uh, I thank God for the kind of living. I used to call the Ashley Street, of course you know where Ashley Street is now. Mm -hmm. Ashley Street was a very, that was the business uh, block of, in the city. Mm -hmm and any kind of business. And that means <laughs> from, uh, from a, a pharmacist, or what, at, during that day it was a drugstore, from mm -hmm. a drugstore to a gambling house, <laughs> to a house of ill repute, <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. bars, it was about three bars. All of this was immediately behind us uh -huh. as we came up. Um, so there was the school, there were the bars and the street filled with other businesses. Mm -hmm. But I mentioned those because either of those could have destroyed any of us. Sure. Yeah. But uh, by the grace of God. Indeed. We came up on that. And what were the family dynamics? Parents, siblings, and your parents? Uh, yes, I, I, my father and mother lived uh, both to uh, the age of 96 mm. and had been married for 65 years when he died. Wow. So I have known of parents in the home all of my days. Mm -hmm. um, good parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, different from parents, mm -hmm. but good parents. Uh, then I had uh, three brothers older and one sister younger. Mm -hmm. yeah. Was yours a religious upbringing? Um, yes. Um, religious upbringing in that day, indeed. Uh, we went to Sunday school, we went to church mm -hmm. twice a day. <laughs> we went to, uh, that was about it. Mm -hmm. Oh no, we had what we call in the Baptist setting. One time it was BYPU and then it became BTU. We sure. had that. 
My father was a deacon mm -hmm. in the church in the latter year, and I, he kept us in, in, in church. Where, what church did you come up in? Grew up in Bethel. Grew up in Bethel. I've never been a member of any other church in my life. <laughs> this is going to be a very, very great story. Yeah. One church all of your life. All my life. Wonderful. When, what were the circumstances of you personally coming to faith in Jesus Christ? Uh, at a, I was 14 years old when mm -hmm. I was... Um, the strange thing about doing that day, uh, particularly among us, it was not so much coming to Christ as it was joining the church. Mm. They meant the same, mm -hmm. but the emphasis was not necessarily upon mm -hmm. um, giving your life to Christ as we have sure. learned in these years. But it was joining the church, but it was an understanding that you believed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was 14 years old. I tell folk I was baptized at 14, but I didn't start living as a Christian until I was in my 20s. Okay, <laughs> sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but a different life. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I started growing and developing as a Christian when I became a man. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. So, what is um, that um, maturing season of your life like? You finish your schooling here, what happens when you finish school? What, what happens? Well, when I finished school, I went into the military mm -hmm. and uh, came out of the military. I was in the military for two years. Which came, branch? Uh, Army. Army. In the Army. Came out of the Army and uh, I went to Tuskegee Institute. Uh, I really hate to talk about those days because I just went to Tuskegee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I get you. <laughs> uh, I, I was not serious at all uh -huh. about study. I was a, a very popular guy, and mm -hmm. I liked that popularity, so it wasn't about studying. <laughs> sure. really. But I had an opportunity to um, come home on, the, on summer, and um, I took the exam for the post office. And during that period, that was a big job. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a well-respected uh, position, to mm -hmm. have, working for the government, on the, uh, particularly in dying days of segregation. So uh, I, I had to make a decision. I passed. But one time I was serious. I passed the exam. And uh, I decided, rather than to go back to school, well, I'm messing up anyway. <laughs> but rather than to go back to school, I take the uh, letter carrier position. And um, I carried mail from that September until January, but then I contracted what was called then osseitis of the bone in my uh, right, right foot. Hmm. And I couldn't walk. Hmm. And if you can't walk, you can't carry a meal. Absolutely. So I was out. And then I was, um, I had to have surgery and I was in, laid up. Doctor told me I'd never walk straight again. Um, so I was in and out of the hospitals for the next three years. And uh, after that, I got out and recovered and recovered in a measure. And I went to, um, back to the post office. Carried mail for 13 years. Mm. Letter carry. Mm -hmm. There, I really didn't didn't sense it in the sen in the in the sense of God overriding what the doctor had said about I wouldn't be able to walk even again because I walked for tw 13 years. Mm. But it was out there in that walk, and I guess all of this was God's design. It was out there. I've always didn't label myself, but as hindsight given it, I was always a people's person. Uh, and uh, I, um, that's where I received my call, mm. uh, out there in those streets, mm -hmm. carrying me. Now, not wanting to get out of the streets, <laughs> sure, <laughs> because I never shall forget, my father in the ministry was Dr. Rob, the late Dr. Robert H. Wilson. And um, I remember going to him because I wanted to be sure this was, I was doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I saw the popularity, I saw a lot of things. I, I, and I, asked, I said to him, well, uh, 
I want to make sure that I'm not going into this for that and that. But he, he always had a word. So he'd, he'd say, well, just for your asking that and seeking to answers for it, is saying that you want to go into it for the right reason. Well, I didn't, I didn't respond, and later on I did, and I mm -hmm. shall forget. Um, it was a revival, Dr. Peace from, late Dr. Peace from uh, um, Philadelphia preaching, and I answered the call mm. uh, to the ministry. And that's what began, that did not begin my Christian way. God began preparing me um, as a, as a, just work, working in the church. Yeah. You know, from, I was a clerk, I was a, even before the deacon, and I directed a choir, a male chorus, mm -hmm. and um, then called to preach. Wow. I want to progress with that part of the story, but let me pause and ask, at what part of this season of your life is um, the establishment of a family? You have, this summer, we're blessed to celebrate 50 years of marriage. Right. At what stage in this season of your life did um, that marriage come into the picture? Well, the, 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 the best woman on planet Earth, as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. <laughs> we dated for off and on for about nine years. Uh huh. And uh, I, I, I'm so glad God always delivers me because I thought I was going to marry another young lady. She was. Uh huh. But God had her design for my life, and we would go off and on, off and on. Sure. So finally, I came to my senses. <laughs> <laughs> came to yourself, huh? Yeah. <laughs> And um, <laughs> we, we got married. Um, I think we knew right off that God had joined us together. Mm -hmm. after Is this that. before you're called to preach or after? I, I'm glad you asked that mm -hmm. because I remember, she declares she doesn't remember this, but I remember when I engaged, when I engaged her, I was in May, I gave her the ring and then I called her back about two days after. I said, oh, I forgot to say to her, I think I'm going to be called in to preach. Because uh -huh. I didn't know whether she wanted to sure. wear a preacher. So I called her back and I said, listen, I forgot to ask you. <laughs> I'm, I, I, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be preaching. Uh -huh. and I didn't know how you felt about it. She said, well, I always wanted to marry. <laughs> I teased her and I said, that's the way you, you just locked me in. <laughs> but that, that actually happened. Oh, wow. That's great. And um, she, was the, she was the person, without question, that I know God placed into my life. Amen. Um, for these 50 years. Amen. Yeah. So thank God for closed doors and open doors. Amen. That's right. um, you mentioned that as you were processing your call to the ministry, you had a discussion with your pastor, Robert H. Wilson, mm -hmm. whom um, those who see this may associate that name with Dallas, Texas. Right. Um, right. not Jacksonville, right. Florida. Right. Uh, but tell us about your pastor and your relationship with him and the influence he had he, on your life. He had a great influence in my life. Um, that's when I really began growing and maturing, really, mm -hmm. as a Christian under his pastorate because of his dynamic teaching and preaching mm -hmm. and his personality. Mm -hmm. yeah. It just drew not just me, but a number of us as guys in, uh, taught him. Um, and I never shall forget this. I, 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 when I answered the call to preach, um, I preached my first sermon. Then, of course, you know, it's a trial sermon. Sure. I had my trial sermon. Dr. Wilson was a stigma with regards to licentiates. Um, you didn't come on the pulpit. Um, he'd get back to you when he got ready to get mm -hmm. back to you. But I remember when he allowed me to preach my first message, a trial sermon. I must have flunked. Because <laughs> I didn't preach again in Bethel uh -huh. until I was interim pastor. Is that right? Yeah. Now, I preached around, mm -hmm. but not. And that was because, I say that was because he would never use a licentiate during that. It was quite different then. 
mm -hmm. never would use a licentiate. And he was a traveling preacher. Mm -hmm. But he would, he, would, he would ask a pastor in the community to come and preach mm -hmm. be, and never would use a licentiate. It, did, it, did he ever explain why that was? Or that just was his policy? That was and, his policy. Yeah. <laughs> The, uh, that generation of preachers didn't yeah. explain what they did. No, no, no. no you just, you, and if you ask, that's when it really you would get it. <laughs> sure. How, how long did Dr. Wilson serve Beth, Bethel Church? 13 years. 13 years. Mm -hmm. And he was called to Dallas? He was called to Dallas. What's the name of the church in uh, Dallas? St. John. St. John, yes. St. John. Uh, and, I, and I never shall forget, I'm indebted to him, and I know God used him, but... Mind you, I said I hadn't preached but once. In Bethel. And when he was ready and had accepted Saint, the call to St. John, he came back to the church and asked the, and recommended me mm. to serve as interim pastor mm -hmm. um, until they call. And, well, let me, let me say, interim pastor. Sure. I didn't know what the interim meant then. So mm -hmm. I went to the dictionary. <laughs> uh huh. Time. Uh huh. And I was in the post office. Uh huh. May uh, I ask, how long had you been preaching at this point? Three years. Three years. Okay. Three years. Not not much time for formal training or anything like no. that. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. He wanted me to go to uh, Florida Memorial at that time, and was in St. Augustine at that time, but in transition to Miami. Okay. I had just gotten married, mm -hmm. and I said, Doc, I, I can't go down there. <laughs> sure. Uh -huh. But I, I, um, I um, uh, when he had recommended me to serve, he explained to me, he said, no, you're not ready, so don't get into your mind that the church is supposed to uh, call you. Okay. And I accepted that. Mm -hmm. And I felt that. Mm -hmm. You know, because first off, Bethel was that statue, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> calling people who were not prepared and whatever. But I didn't expect that. But I, I preached for one year, every Sunday. They never called anyone. And I tell preachers today that if you want God to move into your life, then you do what you are assigned to do mm. and let God do what he's going to do. Mm. Because I never, God blessed me in that, I never did anything to become the pastor. And I, I can go to the grave on that. I never did anything to become the pastor. I did everything because I enjoyed doing it. Sure. I, I struggled in terms of having to work and to preach and to mm -hmm. funeralize and all of these measures of pastoral duty, but I never did it to become. Well, before we move on to the next part of the story, let me, let me pause and ask um, two questions there. The, the first would be, um, what was the church community like in Jacksonville at that time? And what, what kind of church was Bethel at that time? Many of the um, persons who view this may not know that Bethel is considered the oldest church in Jacksonville or in Florida? Bethel is the, I always put it this way, Bethel is the oldest existing Baptist church. Okay supposedly in the state of Florida. Would you tell us that story? Well, that story is, uh, goes back to 1838. Okay. When uh, the church was Bethel Baptist Church mm -hmm. as organized with about uh, five whites and two blacks, either five or seven uh, whites and two blacks. And uh, for 30 years, 1868, hmm. the blacks or the colored at known at that day outgrew the whites in the congregation. And because of segregation and ha not being able to sit where they wanted to sit, they 
can you imagine, in 1838. Wow. And then in 1868, they say, we want to sit everywhere. Mm -hmm. And they had to go to court about it, 1868. Wow. And in 1868, the court awarded the colored Bethel Baptist Church. So you see the history. Mm -hmm. It was Bethel Baptist when they organized mm -hmm. in 1838. It was Bethel Baptist in 1868 that the colored uh, were, was awarded. Okay. The whites withdrew naturally and became Tabernacle, and later First Baptist. Mm -hmm. But we do celebrate the same history. Mm -hmm. And Tabernacle became the historic First Baptist Church right. here, that would be known right. around right. the uh, country I didn't know all well. of this, uh, part of it. Mm -hmm. But uh, the late Dr. Homer Lindsay Sr., mm -hmm. I had been pastoring for about three years then, called me up one afternoon, I said, Brother McKissick, Mm. Let's go back to Bethel. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And the history had, was always that other pastors prior to me, other pastors prior to me had tried to get a connection between First Baptist and Bethel. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it could never get it. Mm -hmm. I never tried, mm -hmm. but Dr. Homer G. Lindsay mm -hmm. made that call to me, and I said, go back to Bethel. I was like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So he says, yes, we haven't been together, and he named it the years. He said, we need to celebrate together. Wow. And we did it for one week. At that time, um, President Sam's was ours, and uh, the, um, Criswell yes. was, mm -hmm. was president of the Southern Baptist. Mm -hmm. Dr. Lindsay had... Dr. Criswell down. Um, from First Baptist Dallas. From First Baptist Dallas. Yes, sir. He had him down on a Wednesday night. And of course, that meant uh, on that Wednesday night, um, both choirs went. And then uh, on Thursday night, Dr. Sams, and they came to Bethel. Mm. Well, First Baptist at that time, we could do pretty good in accommodating, mm -hmm. but it was it was just an awesome setting. I would imagine. Wow. It really was. Now, by the time you are the pastor, uh, or interim pastor at Bethel, what kind of church is Bethel? What's Bethel? Yes, at well, that you, time. You have to understand, too, the dynamics of my having grown up in Bethel, mm -hmm. so that Bethel was the only church I knew. Yes. So it was the church. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh -huh. And that was also a time that culture-wise, you didn't do a lot of visiting. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So that if I ever visited, uh -huh. because we were a very um, high mass type uh -huh. church, you know, with the anthems and uh -huh. hymns, uh -huh and classical spirituals, nothing. So, uh, and if I went anywhere else, I, since that's the only place I'd been. Almost don't feel comfortable. Yeah, that's <laughs> sure. What's sure. wrong with them? Uh -huh, uh -huh. I learned better, mm -hmm. but at that point. So to make a comparison was very, very difficult, mm -hmm. uh, but it was a very, now that I know it, having come up in it, because mm -hmm. it had a stigma. Mm -hmm. you know, oh, Bethel, all of <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, But Bethel, and they had a pastor who baptized me, Dr. John E. Ford, who, who looked exactly, you would think he was white. Mm -hmm. And he was a most, personable individual you could ever find. And I shall always remember that because he has had to come into our home mm. to help us. Mm -hmm. That's how I knew. And so as a boy, I, I knew this man. He baptized me and I knew this man was something else. So it was, they called it the Ford Church because mm. he, was, he was 
earn doctorate. Mm -hmm. Just a prepared man. There's the Johnny Ford School, yeah, the Johnny named Ford. after him. Right. Oh, okay. So uh, I thought Bethel was the pace setter. Sure. And it was so. It's a strong church at the time. Right. You are thrust into this. Your pastor takes the church in Dallas, and he recommends you as the interim pastor. The church receives you as such, yeah. and you are thrust into pastoral duties yes. three years into ministry. What is this like, for instance, preaching every week and all of this for you that you are thrust into? What Too is it? many dangers, <laughs> cars and snares. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. That's the best thing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It had not been. Yes, sir. <laughs> Indeed. And that is the truth. Mm -hmm. Neophyte, without question, but a heart. Mm -hmm. And I can't, I would not want a preacher to think that that's a role that one should expect. Right. But I can say there's nothing that God can't do. Sure. You're not advising that. It's just your I'm testimony. I'm not advising that at Absolutely. all. Absolutely. It's yeah. just your testimony. Yeah. I, said, I wouldn't advise any church to call a 17-year-old boy. That's just my testimony. <laughs> yes, yeah. sir. I fully understand. So... Um, it, you said they were not inviting in. They weren't, it doesn't they seem they were They had a committee, they had a public committee, and sure. of course everybody I knew, they all knew me because I grew up there. Mm -hmm. And then I was active for the last 10 years of Dr. Wilson's 13 years. Mm -hmm. So I was well known. For whatever, what reason they didn't, they told me all the, these names they had of pastors, for why they didn't, bring them in, I do not know. Okay. And I never, never even questioned. But the one thing that happened was after a year, it's almost like from March to March, I went to the chairman of the deacons and said to him that I'm tired. Hmm. And um, it's time for you to, you, you know, make your calls. Uh, this, I have no shame in saying, I said to you in the beginning that I never did anything to become pastor. Mm -hmm. But I never shall forget there's a, a, an area in the old sanctuary adjacent to that old sanctuary called a lecture room. Uh, it was built for lectures only. Mm -hmm. it, but we used to use it for prayer meeting because the sanctuary was too big for mm -hmm. so we used. But I, we were in the lecture room, and I said this to Deacon, the late Deacon Augury, and I said, I'm tired. And he said, well, okay. And I, we, were, we were at a piano that was in the lecture room, that's where I was dressing. And I walked away, and I don't believe I made five steps. And out of the clear, I turned back around and asked him, are you gonna consider me hmm. also? And Pastor Charles, I hadn't anticipated that. That was never on my mind. So I, however it was, that's what I said. Yeah. And they, he said, well, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll make this known to the committee. And uh, they did, and the committee decided to um, uh, address me first and then send letters. And so they did. They said, well, we'll have a conference. And they had a conference on, at that time we were having a Bible, I mean, a prayer meeting on Tuesday night. And I never shall forget, I decided to go to the prayer meeting and, and conduct that. But I was not gonna stay for the voting. And so, uh, as I was sitting in the chair, pastor's chair, and the people were coming in, the Spirit of the Lord said to me, they're coming in here for you, just as plain as day. And I conducted the prayer service and then I left. We lived on 15th Street, about five miles from the or more. And by the time I got home, 
phone rang and the chairman called me and said, they have unanimously called you. Mm. Yeah. I think there were 270, 300 and some, well, congregations were large then. That was a large one. Mm -hmm. uh, out of, we might have had 500. We may have had 500. <clears throat> and so um, I immediately called my father in the ministry, Dr. Wilson. Uh, because I had to, I was to respond, you know this procedure. And I said to him, I said, Dr. Wilson, the church called me. I said, and I don't remember what you told me. I said, and um, I need your, I need your input. He said, uh, what was the vote? And I said, it was 375. He said, but the Lord is already so <laughs> I never shall forget that. Uh -huh. He said, that's your call. Wow. And that's when I began. What a great story. What were the, what were the beginning years? What year was this that you were officially called to serve the church? 1968. 68. If I'm correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What were those opening years of your pastoral ministry like there? First off, the year, the interim year was not a decrease, but rather an increase. Mm -hmm. We maintained, and yet, an increase. So that um, that first year was steady. And uh, it continued to then <clears throat> increase. Wow. Mm -hmm. Challenge, I, I attended my resignation to the post office mm -hmm. to take on full responsibility. And then I went to Edward Waters and Luther Rice. Mm -hmm. And um, because I was the first pastor ever called without a degree, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'd messed around in Tuskegee. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, Luther Rice was here then? It was here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And. Uh, it was a great help, great help. Mm -hmm. So that was my beginning. Okay. And the church uh, just kind of remained steady? Remained steady? Well, no. It didn't no. remain steady. It continued to grow. Continued to grow. It really did. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 it just continued to grow and, and got to the point that uh, I considered staffing mm. because at first, you know, the only staff I had was a secretary. Mm -hmm. And then I, I came up with a position of church coordinator. And that was my first additional staffing. Mm -hmm. And then uh, G. Vincent Lewis, you remember? Did you know him? No, sir. You didn't know G. Vincent Lewis. He was with uh, Bailey for a while. Okay. Uh, G, in fact, he was with Bailey. He, he grew up in Bethel, pretty much in Bethel from a teenager, and uh, under me. And uh, Miles Jones came, did some uh, uh, workshops for us, and he was impressed with Miles Jones. Uh, he had been called into the ministry. And so Miles kind of influenced him to go to Virginia Union. And he did. And uh, he left Virginia Union and went to Dallas with Dr. Bob for foreign mission. And, but he united with uh, E.K. Bailey. Hmm. And uh, I called him and asked him to come with me and serve as Christian uh, education director. And he did and stayed with me for five years. Hmm. Uh, I always would ask them, give me five years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's where my staffing began. Wow. And that's where the broadness of my, I feel, my um, preaching, not necessarily my pastoring, but my preaching because I was challenged right at the house. Mm -hmm. He's a good preacher. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thank God for that. There is something 
about being surrounded by men who are passionate about preaching. That if you're sincere about your work, you don't view that as a threat. It's an encouragement That's for you to take That's your right. work more seriously. Right. And that is one of the things that I think helped Bethel a lot because I, uh, I never shall forget the late uh, Roosevelt Williams, who is Gary's uncle. Mm -hmm. uh, he was called, subsequent to mine, to Mont area. And he would bring the biggest. I had already started. My first, my first uh, evangelist was Wallace Hartsfield. Wow. And, and then from Kansas City. Kansas City, and then he had with Jones. Mm -hmm. I could I went right on down. I would bring them. I brought Miles, and I would bring them. And each time I was, it was like in a class, mm -hmm. just to get these preachers here. Mm -hmm. And Bethel was a supporter of them. Wow, praise yeah. God! And Church that loved preachers. Yeah. They got that from Dr. Wilson, though, really, Sure, he brought them. Sure. Um, you, of course, were influenced by, to some degree, uh, Dr. Wilson. Who else what, what, would you say has influenced you as a preacher? I was once asked, uh, there used to be a radio by a church uh, Sunday school uh, um, program here in Jacksonville, Dr. Earl Cooper, mm. Riverside Baptist. Was, he had me on once, and he asked me at that time, Who, whose preaching influences you? And I thought at that time of a man to me who was just a Bible preacher, and that was Dr. Billy Greer. Mm. And at that point, mm -hmm. I had him as a model of my preaching. Mm -hmm. Dr. Billy Gray? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just thought he was just a phenomenal sure. preacher. And I did. And of course, as I began, began um, pastoring more and more and bringing guys in mm -hmm. other styles and styles, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know of any single one that I that I say except for Miles Jones. I don't know whether you've heard of him. I have indeed. Yeah. Yes, I have. And he was really one. Sure. Yeah. Um, 